Welcome back everyone. Today I played in the semifinals of the Fisher Random World Chess Championship being held here in Reykjavik, Iceland. Now, as you guys know, I qualified along with Magnus Carlsen out of my group two days ago. On the other side, you had Noterbeck Abdus Satorov, the World Rapid Chess Champion, along with Jan Pomniachi, who will be playing for the World Chess Championship. Now, I was matched up against Noterbeck, the very talented Uzbeki junior player, and let's jump right into the games. So in the first game, I had the white pieces, which means I had white in games one and four. Noterbeck had white in games two and three of this four game match. Now, I did not do a whole lot of preparation. As some of you guys know, a few of us are here with seconds. Some of us do not have seconds. So it's very, very up and down. I did not come with a second. So for the most part, I spend my first 15 minutes generally just sitting, looking at the, looking at a few moves, then getting up and walking around and looking at the airplanes at the nearby Reykjavik airport. So for this game, I really only prepared the first couple moves. Now. I played this move f4. Initially, I was trying to figure out whether to play g4, f4. And the reason is that I initially liked g4, but after g5, I wasn't sure. I, I knew that I had f4 transposing back into the game, but I wasn't sure if I should do it. And I thought after f4, if black does not play f5 here, for example, if black plays a move like d5, I thought that after I play a move like g4, opening up the diagonal, followed by a move like f5, I felt like white should be better here. Now, I wasn't 100% sure what's going on. Of course, now that you look at the computer evaluation, it says that black is better, so what do I know? But I thought that by playing f4, maybe I gave Noterbeck a chance to make a mistake. Instead, he plays g5, and after a bit of a think, I just decided to play g4 here, transposing to one of the lines I had looked at very briefly before the game with g4, g5, and f4. So here, Noterbeck takes on f4. I take back, and now he plays this very unusual-looking move, h5. Now, again, one thing that's really important in chess, whether it's regular chess or Fisher Random, is your intuition or that sort of like sixth sense that you have. And for me, I thought h5 just felt a little bit smelly for lack of a better way of putting it so i played bishop f2 targeting the pawn in a7 and also guarding the queen if black plays a move like knight a b6 now i can take the free pawn because my bishop guards the queen on g1 so Noterbeck plays e5 here, which really took me by surprise. And now I now I go wayward with my rook by playing rook b4. Now, I spent a bit of time trying to figure out whether I should play like this. It feels very speculative. I mean, I haven't done anything in the center. I've only pushed pawns on the f and g files, and now my rook is like swinging. And if you guys have watched my streams, you'll know that many times when there are lines, lines which feature like rook lifts and things of that nature very early in the game, I tend to refer to it as new age hippie chess. And so I play this rook b4 move, which really doesn't look right, but I didn't see anything better to do. So Noterbeck plays knight b6, preventing me from capturing the pawn on a7 here. And now I play this move knight c b3. Now, as soon as I play this move, I really regretted it because my whole idea behind going knight c b3 is that I thought I had ideas like knight a5 or knight c5, and I can also castle my king next move because the knight's in the way preventing the castle. So I played knight c b3, and as soon as I did, I regret it because what I realized is that as soon as Noterbeck plays f5 here, now I cannot play knight a5 because after queen takes a2, I will lose either the rook on b1 or the knight on a5. So at this point, I was already regretting it because if I had played knight a, b3, f5, for example, now I can play knight a5 or knight c5 or even a4, a5, and it's very, very unclear what's going on. But with the knight on c1, it does guard the pawn on a2. So as soon as I played knight c, b3, and Noterbeck played f5, I was kind of regretting this option, but the game goes on and you still have to try to play chess. So after f5, I played this move h3, which I knew was not right, by the way, but the reason that I played h3 was quite simple. I felt that if I took on f5 and played this end game after rook f5 castles, I probably can draw the game, but I'm on the wrong side of it, and I felt like Noterbeck would be very happy with this, and I simply was not in the mood to play like this. So instead, I decided to play h3, guarding the pawn on g4. Now here, Noterbeck plays knight e7, which is still a good move, but I felt like in this position, a5 was very testing, and I wasn't really sure what was going on here, but I had a feeling that in this position after king e7, even though black's king is in the center of the board, it's going to be hard for me to castle. And I'm playing without a knight, in, uh, my knight on a1, which is not in the game yet. So I suspected this was probably winning for, for black, but I'm not surprised that Noterbeck didn't play it because, of course, it looks kind of scary from a distance. So he plays knight e7. And now I play this knight c5 move. The idea is very simple. I want to go after the pawn on b7. And if he plays c6 here, there might be some ideas like knight a4, opening up this diagonal, putting pressure on the b file as well. And now there's definitely some counterplay. So Noterbuck plays queen takes a2. And now I play king to c1. Again, I'd love to castle here, but then I would get checkmated. So I go king to c1, and now Noterbeck makes a mistake. He plays knight e to d5. Now, one thing, again, is this position is very imbalanced. It's very hard to play. It's very unusual. One thing you'll notice in a lot of Fisher Random games is positions tend to involve more normal development. You get pieces out, castle as fast as possible. This game is very, very complex. So I've given up a pawn. I have a rook on b4. I have a knight on c5. It's very unusual. 
Now, if Noterbeck had played Queen F7 here, I probably would have lost the game, but I suspect that after Queen F7, he was worried that I could just take on H5, and there's still some lingering pressure towards the pawn on B7, but after E4 here, Black is going to play D6 and C5, or something, or even Knight D5, and I'll combine that with the fact that Black can castle here, Black should be winning. Black has the whole center, not just a big center, but the whole center as well. I have no pawns anywhere even remotely close to the center of the board. So because of that, if Noterbeck had played queen f7, I probably would have lost the game. But instead, Noterbeck plays knight ed5. And this is a mistake because now it allows me to play knight a b3. And after knight b4, rook a1, we reach this position where Noterbeck has given up his queen for two rooks. Now, one one of the many things that are, is very different between Fisher Random and regular chess that I've noticed is that when the pieces are not on the normal starting squares, the imbalances generally don't tend to work out the way they do in normal chess. For example, I've noticed in Fisher Random there are a lot of situations where you can make exchange sacks. You sacrifice a rook for a bishop and a pawn for activity, and those tend to be very good in Fisher Random, much more so than in regular chess. Now, another example is in regular chess. For the most part, we tend to believe that the two rooks are always better than the queen. That's just how we're, we're taught to believe. Now, black has the two rooks for the queen and a pawn as well, but because of the piece configuration, the queen is actually much stronger than the two rooks. So here, Noterbeck plays e4. Now, this is a big mistake here, but I suspect at this point, Noterbeck was sort of a little bit confused because he thought he was winning the game out of the opening. I mean, I play all these weird moves like rook takes f4, rook b4, knight b3, knight c5. It doesn't look right. But now we reach this position where even though Noterbeck has two rooks and a pawn for the queen, he has serious problems. He's still with bishop h4 check. He has to deal with the weakness on b7. And it's very, very hard to play. In fact, the computer says the best move here would be to play knight 6 to d5, which I don't even pretend to understand because after g takes f5, it feels like I have a lot of threats here. The king's not very well placed. The rook isn't, isn't good. The bishops are bad. And it just seems impossible to play. So Noterbeck plays e4, which is in fact a big blunder, but a human move. So now I play bishop h4 check here. He goes bishop f6. He could play king c8, but after g takes f5, there are a lot of problems here. If he takes on f5, I can go bishop takes e4. Now the bishops are loose. Their idea is like queen g8 down the road, and black is in a lot of trouble, if not outright lost here. So instead, Noterbeck plays bishop f6, but now the smoke starts to clear, and I'm going to end up in an endgame where I have a queen and a bishop for two rooks. So we trade the bishops, and now I play queen to d4, attacking both the knight on b4 and the rook on f6. Noterbeck plays knight 4 to d5. He could have gone knight 6 to d5, but it would have led to something very similar, where I play c4. F takes g4. I do not take the knight on d5, because then rook f1 would be checkmate. But after fg4, I go bishop g2. And after g takes eight, g takes h3, bishop takes h3, black will lose either the knight on d5 or the rook on f6. So Noterbeck instead plays knight 4 d5. I go c4. He takes. I play bishop g2. And now he castles. It's worth noting, by the way, I have to be very careful here not to blunder. Because initially, I thought I could take on d5. And after rook f1, king c2, if black plays rook takes h1, I have queen f6 check, king c8, queen to e7. And now let's say black moves the bishop. It's a classic ice skater with queen f8 check and queen e8. And if black plays c6, I can just go d6, and it's the same problem. If you move the bishop, you get checkmated. If you don't move the bishop, I just take and it's checkmate anyway. So this would be winning. But if I were to do this after rook f1, king c2, black has the very nice trick castles here. And now white is still probably better, but I'm only going to have a queen for two rooks because black will win either the bishop on h1 or the knight on a1, and the show goes on. So fortunately, I spotted this, and instead I played bishop g2. Noted about castles here, and now I take on d5, and here he plays rook f5. And at this point, with all the smoke having cleared, this should be a technical win. So I take on g4, he takes on d5, I go queen to c3 plays bishop g6, and now we'll just scoot ahead. Knight c2 takes, knight takes e4. Inevitably, we end up in an end game here where I play b5, he takes, and I take on g3. And now I have a queen and a bishop for two rooks and two pawns. And it should be winning because there really aren't going to be any fortresses with me having the two central pawns. So Noterbeck plays rook f8, I go knight e3, check, king d1, knight c4. We trade the knights, and now I play the move bishop h3 here. Now, it's worth noting, as we'll see in the game, this should this should be a pretty straightforward win, but there is one thing that I did wrong, which is in this position, I play this move d4. Now, the reason that this move is wrong is quite simple. If I had played e4 with the idea of bishop f5 supporting the bishop, this would have been a very straightforward win because the problem is that if black ever sacks, we reach an end game where in this position, eventually with the pawns on e4 and d4, or e5 and d4, it will be winning. But in the game, when I play d4, if black can ever get a position like, let's just say something like this, this could be a fortress. Now, I assume that white is still winning here, but I'm unable to push my e-pawn, and it feels very, very close to a draw. 
So that's why I was actually unhappy with myself when I played d4, because I do have to be a little bit careful here. So after d4, Noterbeck plays rook g7, I go queen to e5, rook e7, queen d6, rook f7, and now I play this move king d2. I also could have played d5 here, but I didn't really want to trade the pawn, so I was worried again that at some point there's going to be some end game. I guess here it doesn't work because I have queen f8, but let's just, just illustrate the point. Where black can get the rook to c6, this again is going to be a fortress. Black can just move the rook between c6 and e6 and make a draw. So instead I play king d2, trying to keep it very slow, eventually playing for e4. Noterbeck plays rook h7, I go bishop g4, rook g7, bishop h5, plays rook f5 here, which is a mistake. He probably should have gone rook e7, but even after rook e7, I can still play the same thing with bishop g6. Idea go to go bishop f5 and e4, and this will be a technical win. At any rate, he plays rook f5, I go bishop g6 here, and now he plays rook f1. Again, if he takes on g6, after takes rook f8, he does not get to play d5, so I can simply play e4 here, and this would be, excuse me, and this would be winning. So instead, Noterbeck plays rook f1. Worth noting, rook d5 would also lose to queen f8, winning the rook on g7. So he plays rook f1. Now I get e4 with the idea of bishop f5, and it's a classic wooden shield, and the game is basically over. So Noterbeck plays a5 here. Now I go bishop f5, targeting both the pawn on d7. Queen f8 check is a threat as well, and the rest is pretty straightforward. He plays rook f7. I go queen e5, targeting the pawn on a5, also threatening queen e8 to collect the rook on f7. King d8, I take, I check goes back I check and now I go king e2 here now the reason that I repeat it is I want to make sure that takes takes d5 was not a draw but this is very simple or sorry b5 is not a draw but there are many ways to win here but simplest is just queen a3 king f6 check king f5 and something like d5 here and there will be no fortress because I will be able to collect all three of these pawns eventually so Noterbeck plays rook g1 I check I check and now I gobble b7 as well he goes king f8 I check check king f8 now i check he goes back he can't go to e8 here because of bishop g6 which would win the rook on f7 so he goes king g7 i gobble the pawn on d7 now so i'm just i'm just eating all his pawns he plays rook f1 i check and after king h6 bishop f5 rook e1 king d2 rook d1 king e3 he resigns here i have a queen a bishop and a pawn for the two rooks and checkmate will be following very shortly so i win this very critical first game of the match and in a four game match it's really important to try to put pressure and set the tone early and winning this game definitely i think came as a big surprise Noterbeck was was certainly not expecting to be under so much pressure let alone lose in the first game so let's move on to the second one now, I'm not going to go super in-depth on this one, um, but we'll, we'll go through it. So second game, same position, colors reverse. Noterbeck plays f4, I play f5 here, g4, g6, knight b3, knight b6, and now Noterbeck makes a big mistake. He plays his natural-looking move, knight to d3. Now, for those of you guys who have watched previous videos on Fisher Random, or even videos I think I've done of a match I played against Levon in St. Louis in 2018, I believe, or no, in 2019, right before the FIDE World Cup in... Um, I think Hanti Monsisk, if I'm not mistaken, or somewhere, somewhere like that. Um, there was a game where, where Levon put a knight from c8 to d6 in front of a pawn on d7. And at the time, I thought it was a big mistake because I, I played d3. Now, in this game, it's the same thing where I played d6. And I don't really think knights in front of pawns on the edge really matter all that much. But I think specifically on the e and d5, if you put a knight in front of the pawns and black is able to cover the two jump jumping squares on e5 and c5, or conversely on e4 and c4, I think it's just a fundamental blunder in Fisher Random. Um, and I think people will eventually learn that you can't do it. So after knight d3, d6, I already felt very confident because unless I don't understand Fisher Random, I think this is just a blunder by Noterbeck, a positional blunder. So he takes on f5, he goes bishop h4, and now after c5, you already start to see the problem. The knights are kind of misplaced here. The knight on d3 doesn't really have any jumps. It's going to have to retreat, or I go c4, and the other knight has to retreat, and it already feels very tough to play. So Noterbeck trades, he goes knight a5, play king c7, and now he makes he makes sort of the final mistake that costs him the second game. He plays this move b4. Uh, what he should have done was played c4 here, and after, after a move like bishop f7, rook c1, knight d7, and bishop f6, position's probably pretty balanced here. I don't think either side is better, per se, um, but Noterbeck shouldn't lose. But when he plays b4 after I go c4, now he ends up with a knight on the rim, which is very dim because it cannot take the pawn on c4 or go back to b3. If white were to try knight c4, for example, after it takes bishop d5 with a double attack, I just go rook g4 attacking the bishop on h4, and I'm going to end up winning a piece here. So Noterbeck plays knight e1, and now I go bishop f7, plays knight f3, and now I play c3. Now this is a move I didn't want to play initially because what I thought I could try to do is something like knight a4 and b6 to trap the knight. But as I realized, if I play knight a4, there's knight g5 attacking the bishop, and then I would end up in a lot of trouble. 
And if I play something like h6, after bishop f2, here white is going to get knight to d4. And I wasn't really sure how much better I am, so I thought that c3 was just a very thematic move to kind of ruin his pawn structure. If he, first of all, I'm targeting pawn a2, and if he plays d3, I might even have knight d5 attacking the pawn on f4 and threatening knight e3 with the fork. So Noterbeck plays a3, and now I go h6 here, a very quiet waiting move just to prevent knight to g5 here, because he has a very passive bishop on h1, the knight on f3 has no squares, the pawn on d6 and the pawn on h6 prevent the jumps. Of course, knight d4 also isn't possible because of the bishop on h8. So I play h6, and now Noterbeck plays e3, I go knight to d5, centralizing the knight, also preventing white from moving the d-pawn if d4 I just take, and of course if d takes c3, I can even just take on c3 as well. So I go knight d5, he plays knight d4, I trade, and then he takes on d5, which by the way just loses the game. He, he should have just taken here, but at this point after having lost the first game, I think being in such a miserable position here, um, he, he was already just kind of zoned out or on tilt, and he takes on d5, and now the rest of the game is actually very straightforward. I take, I go rook g2 here, plays takes, I take on h2. Material is still even, but I have an outside h pawn. I've got a great wooden shield in the middle of the board here. Additionally, his pawns are about as bad as they humanly can be. And I'm gonna have knight b6 to blockade the pawn push. So he goes bishop g3 here, play rook h3, goes bishop b1, I go knight b6, preventing c4. And now you can just see all these pawns are just absolutely horrible. I also have a great bastion with knight c4 at some point. So the game should simply be over already. So he goes rook g1. I play rook g8, we trade. He castles finally on move number 22, but it's just too little too late. I go h5, bishop f2, h4. Plays c4, which kind of just loses on the spot. He could have tried rook g1 here, but he, even rook g1, after bishop d5, rook to g7, for example, I can simply play the very nice in-between move rook h2. If he takes on e7, um, I believe king d8, rook e2, and king d7 followed by h3, h2, it's just going to be winning. Um, and if he plays a move like bishop g1, I mean, there, there are many ways to win, but probably rook e2 is simplest with h3 and rook e1 threats. And if king d1, just bishop to f3, and this would be lost. So Noterbeck could have tried this, I guess, and maybe it's a better try. And, but instead, he plays c4 here, hoping for a miracle and some counterplay. But unfortunately, after bishop takes c4, d5, bishop takes d5. I think Noterbeck initially thought that he could take, take on d5. And after b takes a5, maybe after rook takes a5, there's some drawing chances. Black's only up a pawn here. It's probably losing regardless. But I don't even have to go for this, as Noterbeck, I think, noticed during the game, because if he takes on b6 here after rook takes d5 i have the in-between move pawn to e6 attacking the rook and guarding the pawn on f5 and now when he plays rook d1 after takes let's just say b takes a5 rook f3 i'm going to end up with three connected pass pawns and he has all these pawns on the queen side which are absolutely miserable so this would just be over so Noterbeck at this point could have resigned, but he plays another move, he plays c4, I take the pawn on c4, and now if he were to try for the same thing with bishop b6, I just take, and after knight c4, I have rook c3 check to collect the knight on c4, again, up two pawns and a very cleanly winning rook and pawn endgame. He plays rook e1, and after king d7, he just resigns because, well, I mean, obviously takes, takes knight c4, rook c3 is winning, his knight's on the rim, he's losing a3, and there's just no, there's just no hope here. So Noterbeck resigns the second game, and with that, I move ahead 2-0 in the match. So very, very good start, obviously, just what the doctor ordered, um, and what to say. So let's move on to the third and final game now. Of course, that might be a spoiler, quote unquote, but you guys will obviously know what the match score was. Anyway, so third game, new position. I start with black, and I was actually very unhappy with this position because, again, like many starting positions, we end up with knights in the corner, and the development from the corner is very unusual and weird. And combined with the fact that actually, I felt that, oh, I felt that white should... I thought actually, wow, so computer says 0.99. So I'm not crazy. Before the game, when I was looking very briefly, I was very concerned about f4 because if I tried to mirror with f5, I thought after bishop d4, I have to play something like rook f7. And I think after something like castles, white is much better here. Um, I don't know how much better, but I was very concerned about f4 because you can't mirror. I was also very concerned about knight g3, which happens in the game. And the computer actually gives us this plus 0.7. So this is one of those positions which is very difficult to play. So after knight g3, I play g6, trying to follow the human things of stopping the knight from jumping to h5 or f5. Noterbeck plays b4, I go f5, he plays c4, and now I play this move e5. Now, I was aware that Jan had also played the same starting opening against Magnus, um, but it looked, it made sense. I thought, why not just follow Jan? He is, of course, playing for the world championship title very soon. 
So I play e5 here, and now Noderbeck plays e4. Now Magnus in his game actually played f3, which the computer thinks is the top move, but Noderbeck plays e4, down to zero, desperately needing to win the game, he goes all in. So here I play f4, he plays knight e2, and now I, I just go for it with f3. In retrospect, I, I think that if I could do it again, I probably would have played g5, knight g6 with ideas like knight h4 and just d6, and try to play it a little bit like a king's Indian, um, rather than going for all those super crazy complications with f3, but alas, I played it. So he takes, I go bishop e6 here, and the reason I say complications is because here white is going to be losing his rook on f1. I will be able to play bishop h3 and win the rook. He moves the bishop after bishop h3. Still no squares, even if he castles, I just take the rook. He obviously cannot castle to the king side because the bishop is in the way. So after bishop e6, I know that I'm going to have bishop h3 winning the rook. On the other hand, however, after f4, it gets very, very messy because white there is going to be a big white center here, potentially with fe5 and d4. Now in this position, I chose to play bishop h3, which I think, you know, looking back on the game was a big mistake. I probably should have just taken and given him a bit of a center here. Uh, I think I was kind of worried about rook c3 and d4, but probably something like g5 and knight g6, and I suspect that I should be okay here, but it's kind of tricky anyway. So instead I play bishop h3, Noderbeck captures, and now I start to get a little bit wonky with what I'm doing. In this position, what I probably should have played was something like knight f7, d4, and c5, um, which I had calculated. I thought after takes bishop h5, knight c3, there should be something here. I wasn't sure what, um, or even knight g5 as well, but I felt like there should be something. But the problem is if I'm wrong here, white just has this huge, huge center here, and I'm just gonna lose the game. Like even knight g5, f4, for example. Look at all these white pawns as they're going up the board. Instead, however, I played c5. Now this was based sort of on a fundamental concept that I thought I could prevent white from getting a big center, and I thought I was getting counterplay. So Noderbeck takes, and now I take on f1, he takes, and I play b6 here. I'm gambiting another pawn, but in the process, I'm bringing my knight into the game very quickly. So Noderbeck takes, I take back, and now he finds an excellent move, the best move of the position, e6 here. I already was feeling very optimistic here because if white plays c5, for example, I can go knight to c4. If he takes the queen, I take the pawn with check. And after king e1, knight f3, king f1, rook b8, black is just better here. Additionally, if white goes king g2 after rook b8, again, it's an end game. And I thought I should be okay, although apparently computer thinks after f4, white is much better. Go figure. At any rate, I thought I was kind of doing okay here. But Noderbeck found e6, which is an excellent move, because now the problem is if I, if I, I had to do something. Let's say I take on c4, for example, knight c4, trying to follow it. After takes, takes queen d3, I'm actually completely lost. If I play knight d6, white can go e5 here. And after rook c1, knight c1, I'm going to be losing the knight on d6 because of the pin. So I can't really block. And if I play queen d6, for example, in this position, white now is the amazing move queen h3 check. And after queen to e6, it still feels like I'm kind of hanging on. But now white can trade the queens and go knight to d4, followed by bishop to g, or actually, sorry, not knight d4, sorry, bishop b3, followed by d3, just winning the knight on c4. So I was very unhappy that I had to take. And now he goes queen b5 check, knight d7. Uh, he trades and now he plays d4 and practically speaking i think i think i have some chances to hold this but it's very difficult because white has there's a big white center white has two pass pawns that he can push he also has this great light square bishop which i can't really contend with so it's a very difficult position to play so here i play knight f7 very simple concept of playing knight d6 to, to fork the pawns on e4 and c4 Noderbeck plays bishop a4, now I go king to e7, and now he plays c5. Again, very important move here, understanding that he has to push the pawns to the center as fast as possible. So I play knight g5, he goes d5, and now I play this move e5. Now, I knew this was a bad move and probably losing, but I thought that after knight takes e4, d6, for example, king f6 and f3, king g7, king g2, I thought that I was just getting blown away here, although apparently computer thinks I can just take... K can play some bishop b6 with rook d8, and maybe it's maybe it's not that bad, but I didn't even see this, and I thought I was just lost, so I chose to play e5. Noderbeck goes rook c4, and now I play this move knight d7, which I actually thought was a blunder. After the game, I thought that I should have played the other order with knight f3, knight to b3, and then knight d7, but ultimately the reason I rejected this order is that when I, because after knight d7, if white plays uh, a move like knight b3, I have this very tricky move, knight b6, with the fork of the rook and the bishop. If white captures, he loses the rook on c4, so that's ultimately why I played knight d7. Noderbeck trades, and now he makes a big mistake here. He plays this move knight b3, completely missing the one idea I have in this position. 
I was very concerned about my position if Noderbeck played f4 here. Now, this gambit's a pawn, but more importantly, if I take the pawn, this bishop is now active. White has moves like c6 or even e5 with the three connected pawns just marching way up the board. And I suspect that I would have lost this game if he had played f4. Instead, Noderbeck plays knight b3, guarding the pawn, completely over overlooking this move knight f3. And the reason this move is so powerful here is that now white is stuck in a position where he's playing without a bishop on g1. My knight on f3 obviously can always go to like d4 or d2 down the road, but white does not have a way to get this bishop into the game. So this is a big mistake. And already once I got this move in, I felt actually quite good. and I thought I was going to be able to save the game. So Noderbeck plays rook a4. I play a5 here. Of course, he cannot take the pawn on a5 because then he loses the pawn on c5. So he goes knight c3 here. Now I go rook b8. Important move because white would love to go c6. So say I play g5, for example, after c6, king d6, knight b5, king e7. There's d6 and everything is winning for white. So I decide to play rook b8 so that when he goes c6, king d6, there is no knight b5 check here. So he plays h3 here. I just play h5. And now it goes rook c4. I could have played rook b4 already here, but I wasn't 100% sure what was going on after takes and knight b5 with the same ideas of c6 and d6, and it just feels very scary. So instead, I play h5. Now he goes rook c4. And now I play this move bishop h4. Idea, maybe I can take on g1 and put pressure on the f2 pawn and, and maybe even a double stack with drawing chances, but mainly it was just a move to play that made sense. So he goes c6 check, and now I go king to c7. And here Noderbeck misses a line which is winning, which is not human at all. But it is very thematic. Now, the one line that is winning here for white is to play as knight c5. And the reason this is winning is because it looks like, okay, it's just a blunder, knight d2. Just fork the king and the rook. But after king to e2, knight takes c4, knight to e6 here. If I go king c8, he just takes the rook. If I, if I go king to b6 as well, white can just play f3. And after king to a6, I get checkmated by knight c7 here. My king simply has no squares. So the only logical move is king d6. But now there's the amazing move pawn to f4, threatening bishop c5 checkmate. I cannot play rook b5 because the knight on c3 covers that square. And this is simply just lost. After king e7, bishop c5. Uh, if I move knight d6, he just takes on e5, and I'm going to lose the knight. If I play, actually, maybe, maybe sorry, knight d6, f5 might actually be wrong, so there might be a trick with rook b2, but first he can play knight f8, and after rook f8, f takes e5, this is just game over. So at this point, I mean, this is, this is obviously very complicated and not something I would expect to find, but this is winning for white. In a classical game, maybe you can find it. But at this point already, Noderbeck's getting low on time. He's unsure of what's going on. And he plays the move knight to d1 instead. And this is a big mistake because now I can now I could have played rook b4, which actually, I don't know why I didn't play it here. Uh, but I played bishop e7 first. But this was based on a miscalculation because after king g2, rook b4, knight e3, I simply forgot that d6 check was an actual threat here. So say I play a move like a4. After d6, I lose. Maybe I don't lose. I still have some counterplay. But there's this idea with knight d5 with a fork. And the show goes on. Um, apparently black is still better here but i actually overlooked this completely um when i played this bishop e7 or i would have played rook b4 right away so i, I go for bishop e7 king g2 rook b4 knight e3 now i trade the rooks and already the smoke is kind of clearing because with only the two knights and this blockade on the dark squares if white cannot get a knight to either b5 or a6 i should eventually be able to win the game especially because he has this dead bishop on g1 still so here I play rook f4, and now after a long think, Noderbeck plays knight d2. There aren't really any, there aren't really better options here. If he plays a move like knight c takes a5, for example, I can just take and play uh, rook takes e4, and eventually I'm going to win these pawns on d5 and c6. If he plays knight b takes a5, another option. There are a couple ways to play this, but I saw the simple takes, takes rook e4, and after knight e3, bishop c5, knight c4, takes, takes rook a4, king g2, takes, king f3, rook a4. I can never really lose here because I can put the rook on d4 and white can never move the knight because I win the pawn and he also can't really get the king anywhere so this maybe is winning still for black but at the very least I can't lose and knowing that it draws enough I, I was very confident. So instead Noderbeck plays knight d2 really the last gasp but unfortunately now I trade and I go bishop b4 targeting the bishop on or the knight on d2 and the pawn on e4 is going to fall along with it, the entire chain is probably going to fall as well. So he plays knight f3, I take on e4, he plays bishop h2. Now I go bishop to d6, blockading, 
and he goes bishop g3. If he were to play knight g5, this looks very scary on first glance because if I play rook d4, I lose to knight e6. But I can play rook a4, and then after knight to f7, I have the very nice move rook to d4, which just wins the game here. Very similar to what happens, in fact. It takes, takes, c7, I just go rook c4, and I win the pawn. And if white takes on e5, I'll just take on d5. So it looks scary on first glance, but it really doesn't do anything. So he plays bishop g3, I go rook a4, attacking the pawn on a2. Plays knight takes e5, and now I play this move rook d4. And after this move, both the pawns on d5 and c6 will fall. And with it, the game is simply over. So Notarbeck continues with knight g6. I play rook takes d5. He trades on d6. Goes knight e5. And now I just simply go after the a2 pawn, because with this fast a pawn, knight will have to come back, and there's really not much that white can do. Notarbeck plays a3. I go rook a2. Knight c4 here. Play a4. King g3. Rook c2, attacking the knight. Knight e5, rook to c3, check, winning the pawn on a3, and now the pawn is very, very close to queening. King h4, I take, and after f4, I play rook a1, and here Noterbeck resigns because of the fact that the pawn is simply unstoppable. If he plays f5 just to, uh, for a sample line, I go a3, f6, rook f1, and he can't stop the pawn here of f7, I just go a2, a1. Conversely, king g5, a2 is also winning. So at this point, there really isn't anything that white can do. So after rook to a1, Noterbeck resigns this third game of our match in the semifinals of the Fisher Random World Championship. And with that, I advance to the grand finale tomorrow against either Jan Nepomniachtchi or Magnus Carlsen. Currently, Jan is leading 2-1 in that match. They're playing the fourth game right now. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, I don't really have a preference in terms of who I play, but it's just great to be in the finals. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap. And I will be doing a recap regardless of the result tomorrow when I play in the grand finals of the Fisher Random World Chess Championship. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys soon. Have a good one. Bye.